All right, good morning. It's good to be here with uh, Big Room Talks Healthcare with uh, trends and innovations in healthcare construction. Uh, my name is David Tomac, and I'm the group, pre group president for uh, Western Operations for the Bolt Company. Uh, before we get into this too deep, I'll give you just a little background on the Bolt Company. We're a 133 year old uh, business. Um, we're headquartered in the thriving metropolis of Appleton, Wisconsin. We have 14 locations, uh, office locations throughout the United States. Um, and that's in about seven different states, uh, roughly 1,300 craft personnel, 600 salaried personnel, our annual volumes about a billion dollars. And you can see across the bottom here, the industries we're in, healthcare, commercial, educational, um, industrial, power, public, so on and so forth. We do have job sites that essentially span the United States. Um, uh, we do some work in Canada and we've actually been international at times, but we're not right now. A little bit about me, uh, I've uh, located out in the great state of California. I live in Walnut Creek, I've uh, been here about 10 years. Grew up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and have uh, about 30 years of experience in the industry. Plus or minus half of that has been with the Bolt Company. Uh, my passion is building teams, uh, developing and delivering uh, large complex projects, and uh, developing our organization. Um, and uh, of course, learning along the way. So the uh, a little bit of a uh, knack for continuous improvement. So challenges that our uh, healthcare customers are facing these days is, and this is across the board, many customers, construction cost increases. A big one is de uh, decreases in reimbursement or different styles of vehicles for reimbursement. Um, greenhouse gas reduction, how we're focusing and handling uh, COVID-19 or any type of uh, pandemic, uh, aging infrastructure, changing technology, um, having resilience and agility in our operations, as well as making sure that our um, environments that we create are inclusive, they're diverse, and, um, and we're being equitable across our workforce. So trends and innovations um, in healthcare construction, uh, there's, there's a number of them, and I actually am pretty passionate about uh, most of these. Uh, project delivery, prefabrication and modularization, integrating uh, energy solutions, supply chain innovation, uh, predictive analytics, um, artificial intelligence, and uh, production planning. In the spirit of time today, we're gonna to try hit on uh, just three of these, uh, project delivery, prefabrication, modularization, and integrating energy uh, solutions you know, into the, uh, the overall campus plan. So we'll start with, um, uh, you know, what does this all mean? Uh, as, as we talk about integrated lean project delivery, I'll give you a little bit of background and, and our story in that. Uh, StatMod is our current um, solution to the uh, prefabrication modularization. And then talking about, we'll talk a little bit about integrated construction services. So how, how healthcare uh, facilities and, and many others are integrating energy and power, uh, different solutions and flexible options into their, um, uh, into their game plan. Okay, so let's dive right into uh, integrated lean project delivery. Um, integrated project delivery is a term that's uh, been around for 10 to 15 years. It's, um, uh, you know, it was the Bolt Company were, were early adopters of this type of uh, project delivery. Really focuses on uh, bringing teams together, tying uh, interests, uh, and making sure that as we work our way through the project, contractors, designers, uh, and owners that we're, um, we're doing so um, with a collective, uh, the collective ideas um, and goals of the greater team. The Bolt Company uh, has been on our learning journey, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, uh, for over two decades now. And so when we integrate or we combine integrated project delivery with Toyota's lean production model, um, that's what we call integrated lean project delivery. So, the, you know, the greatest things uh, that we pull out of IPD is collaborative teams, um, aligned incentives, uh, and very uh, respectful treatment for uh, all partners within the uh, facility delivery process. On the lean side of thing is uh, solving problems fast, right? So when you fail, fail fast, learn from it, move on, try not to do it again, remove waste from, this, uh, from the value stream, and ultimately work, uh, provide uh, improved workflows uh, from day one all the way through day, in many cases, 1,500, uh, to make sure that we're v adding value um, along uh, all along the way. So just, you know, re real quickly, Bolt's uh, lean journey, uh, maybe in 
1998, 1999, you know, we, we really took a took a hard look at uh, this this production issue that's been ailing our industry for years and years, and quite frankly, it still ails us uh, today. And said, so, well, what are we going to do about this? And why don't we take a look at um, um, you know diving into the lean community and see if there's things that we can we can pull out um, and adopt and change the way we do business. So we really focused on the last planner system and managing scheduling, making commitments to each other uh, on all our projects. As we got, you know, five years into that, 10 years into that, we really started to advance our thinking. So how do we now incorporate some of the latest and greatest um, techniques for learning and sharing information into the delivery of our constructed facilities, no matter what type of contractual uh, makeup we have? Uh, but then uh, we jumped into uh, some, some really exciting IPD projects where we were able to really harness uh, the creative potential of all the workers, um, and that's the folks in the office as well as the field, um, optimize um, and maximize some of the lean techniques um, and deliver projects in a way that we see is actually the future uh, of construction. Again, we're right on the, um, on the early adopter edge, but we're starting to see more and more uh, IPD projects uh, come to fruition, especially in the, uh, in the healthcare industry. And, you know, but at the end of the day, what we're seeing, what the data shows on our ILPD projects is that, um, you know, we're delivering projects below market benchmarks. Um, we're delivering them faster um, and certainly on time. And so from an efficiency standpoint, um, our customers uh, in the healthcare uh, industry are, are getting, getting more bang for their buck, if you will. So just real quick, I, I hit on this uh, earlier. Uh, you know, traditionally design, bid, build. We have an owner that has separate contracts with uh, the design team, uh, the general contractor, as well as a specialty vendors and people that are coming into the building. We find that to be, that's probably the, that's the most widely adopted uh, contractual arrangement in the industry. We've seen a lot of momentum over the past 20, 30 years in the design, build arena. And that pulls at least the interest of the designer and the contractor has a single form of uh, contract with the owner, takes a little bit of the waste out of the value stream uh, allows uh, good communication um, and is, is a really good way to deliver projects. Uh, certainly pref preferable uh, to us from an outcome standpoint than traditional design bid build. Integrated project delivery pulls everybody together, um, puts them on the same field, ties incentives together, um, and ultimately optimizes uh, the outcome of everyone's misaligned interests, uh, interests uh, which we see in the other two delivery methods brings them all together and incentivizes the team to, uh, to be successful uh, as, as just that a team. So with IPD, we get co-located teams that are, you know, are filled with the, the people that actually do the work, right? So the, the last planners that we talked about early on uh, in this presentation, uh, as well as the people that are installers of the work. Um, we get uh, continued learning. Um, we're able to evaluate many more uh, design options and, uh, and understand the decisions and the ramifications of those decisions based on what is considered to be value, is communicated as value by each one of the owners um, in the project. Um, budget influence with design, that's uh, the most important piece, uh, the most important statement coming out of target value design, which is a big part of, of ILPD. Um, and at the end of the day, we're designing for both optimal performance on the end side, but then also optimal production in getting there. And that's what allows us to keep our costs in check or under what our goals are and deliver projects on time, maximize value, minimize waste. Um, I just want to hit um, this organization piece, this behavior, culture, leadership. When you get a really high performing IPD team, um, it's amazing the work that they can do. Um, the teams that I've been part of and I've seen within the industry and our organization are some of the, the best experiential um, teams, uh, the best environments that people have worked in, and they've, they've stated that they can't wait to, uh, to actually do the next one. A couple examples. Um, in uh, San Francisco here, just down the road, uh, Sutter Health Hospital uh, at the Van Ness and Geary campus, this is a, it's a big job, right? So this is a $1.3 billion construction project, uh, full IPD. It's a three-party agreement. Um, with uh, numerous trade partners tied to the same uh, incentive pool. Uh, the project finished at $12 million under budget um, and uh, below our target cost and uh, uh, below market value. 
it was delivered on time, which for those of you that have worked on mega projects uh, know that that uh, doesn't happen very often, right? When we start getting into these billion dollar projects, uh, the percentage of those that finish not just behind schedule, but woefully behind schedule and uh, outside of the budget and woefully over budget uh, is a big number, like to the tune of 98% of, of all uh, mega projects. This is about a million square feet. So uh, a big job and, a, and just a great experience. Akron Children's Hospital is a project that we did a few years ago uh, in Ohio. Uh, project came in $24 million below the market cost. Um, total value is $176 million, so not quite as big as, uh, as our project here in California. Uh, finished two months ahead of schedule and is about a third of the size. So again, just another great story of a project that um, uh, teams came together and, and, and delivered uh, on the promises and um, created a, a great experience for owners, designers, and uh, the contractors on the project. And then uh, Advocate Healthcare is, uh, uh, this is a system of projects. So a bunch of ambulatory facilities, we'll just call it in the Chicago land area. Um, and this is 25, 26 projects that we've worked on now with uh, Advocate System uh, delivering $13 million in savings on the projects and spending you know, all that while spending about $121 million over, over a course of those 20 plus projects. So that's just a that's just a, a little bit of insight into uh, ILPD integrated lean project delivery. Uh, the next innovation that we want to hit on is uh, StatMod, which is uh, a, a very uh, timely and strategic response to COVID-19. Um, StatMod is uh, strategic temporary uh, acuity adaptable treatment modules. Right, so these are. Um, you know, as we as we saw, and everyone's <laughs> seen these uh, these charts, we're probably getting sick of seeing them. In fact, we're hoping at some point they just kind of die down, but they, this thing just keeps coming back. But um, what happened uh, for us is uh, right at the beginning of March, uh, this COVID-19 hit, and we could see right away that um, you know, customers are saying, "Look, we're we're going to run out of beds. We need a place to put uh, these these uh, patients as they come in, and we need it fast." and you know, there was a number of solutions across the country that we saw, right? We saw gymnasiums that were transformed into temporary facilities. We saw um, <clears throat> tents that would be put up in uh, parking lot areas. We saw older buildings uh, temporarily uh, transitioned into, um, uh, into facilities that could, uh, that could deal with the treatment. Uh, but there was a, there was a, very, uh, a very specific need that um, some of the clients were asking for, and, and so we teamed up with uh, HGA and we came up with a solution, which was um, modules, if you will, uh, the strategic temporary acuity adaptable treatment modules that were essentially, um, they are um, negative pressure uh, modules uh, that, are, that are more than, they're temporary, but they're not as temporary as some of these other solutions. These have about a 10 year lifespan on them. Um, we're able to produce them fast, get them to where they need to, to go. And then um, the uh, facilities, the hospitals uh, that are bringing them in can use them right now for the, the COVID-19 response. Uh, but then as the next thing comes down the road, they can use these as, um, as, as part of their facility uh, um, solutions. So what you see here, um, they're, they're pretty simple, uh, but they're very beautiful. Um, so each one has exterior windows. The rooms are 15 feet wide. You'll see on the next slide that they're 12 and a half uh, 12 and a half wide, 15 feet long, so they can uh, be transferred on a truck. Um, they have a donning station for PPE, a doffing station, um, and then they allow the flexibility inside for patients to be treated without putting um, any, anyone outside of this room at risk of the uh, fast spreading uh, COVID-19 virus. This is just a, just a view of what are the, one of the modules look like on a, on a truck. It's, uh, they're about 10 feet tall. This one is a 40 foot long module and 12 and a half feet wide. So we're limited by what it can actually haul down a road um, in set in place. The first generation of the stat mods were actually produced um, in, uh, in our warehouse uh, in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, this, is, this is actually a solution where uh, the stat mods actually go inside uh, a large warehouse building. So one of the things I think is really important to note um, on this is that these can tie into um, the, the facilities that exist. So we can tie into the services that are existing in a facility or they can be standalone. So we have uh, many instances where we've actually brought power directly to the stat mod units 
um, and we've created uh, the collection systems that would allow the, um, uh, the, the plumbing, HVAC, gray water, et cetera, uh, to be collected so it wasn't tied into, um, uh, tied into an existing facility just because that was a solution some of the customers asked for. This is a photo of our current uh, production facility. And you know, quite honestly, right now, the challenge we have is really all about um, supply chain, right? We can't, um, we're having a difficult time uh, producing uh, these things uh, f fast enough, right? So um, this is actually uh, a space that we took over. It's the former uh, Manitowoc Crane Building um, where they used to produce some of the largest crawler cranes in the world. Um, the, it's been vacated and we spent about a week to get it turned into a fabrication facility. So this is now where our stat mods are rolling through, they're being produced and then shipped out. Um, from a standpoint of where they're going to, uh, you know, the first set of modules uh, went out to the East Coast um, and uh, we now have uh, modules that are going to Georgia. Um, there's some in Wisconsin. Um, and then we're uh, looking at uh, opportunities for these modules to go to uh, Oregon right now, uh, New Mexico, and even our neighbors to the north here in Canada. So there's a, there's a huge demand for this. And what we're trying to do is just increase the thr throughput so we can get these in, in place for the customers that need them. This is really exciting, right? We've been dealing with modularization for some time. This is the first time that I've, I've seen a real need pull what it is we need, uh, what, they, what they need, and we're being able to deliver um, on the promises, uh, just based on, you know, the old adage that uh, necessity breeds innovation. This was a group of people coming together, working around the clock 24 seven to produce a solution that met the needs of uh, what was a, a, a national international crisis. Here's the finished product. Um, the, uh, this particular unit uh, was, as it was delivered out East to the, you know, the customer, uh, you know, actually said that the, the, the rooms that they come in and work in are actually nicer than their existing uh, hospital facilities. So uh, really good, uh, really good feedback and uh, just a great story of, of innovation for our healthcare partners. And the last thing I'm going to hit on here pretty quick, um, just from uh, terms of uh, timing is healthcare and how we're tying into campus utilities and, and just what the overall environment is for uh, energy and power in the healthcare communities. So um, <clears throat> we've had this uh, conversation over the uh, over the years, CHP, combined heat and power, and, and what does that mean? And, and you know, many times we hear a difference between campus energy and combined uh, heat and power, and it's actually they can be used interchangeably. And in fact, either or both can be considered campus energy. So just as we go along here, when we talk about the H, that's thermal generation, steam, steam hot, chilled, uh, chilled water, or air. And then the P is the power side, the electrical generation. Um, and then what we're seeing in our, our, our hospital campuses is some combination um, to provide the, is the full island experience, right? So they're completely self-sufficient versus a grid connected mode. But what's really important is the collaboration and the cooperation between the, the historical uh, power um, and uh, utility providers, as well as what the uh, what the healthcare facilities need these days. So it's a lot going on this slide. I don't expect that you'll have time to read it all, but I'll I'll just give you the punchline: is that in the state of California, there's 868 facilities that generate over 4,000 megawatts of their own power. 47 of those are hospitals that are generating about 102 megawatts of uh, their own power. Um, mostly coming through uh, a, a gas solution. That 47 number, um, to put in perspective, there's about 180 campuses statewide, hospital campuses. So this makes up roughly 25% of them. So 25% of hospital campuses have some sort of um, energy solution that is being supplied, augmented on their campus versus what they're getting from their traditional uh, power and utility supplier. Um, and that trend is gonna continue to go up, not just in hospitals, but um, through all these facilities that you're seeing here. And so what are the drivers for this? And, and you know, this re reliability from a power and thermal standpoint is really important for maintaining critical operations when the grid is down. 
most of the hospital facilities already have redundant energy feeds, but in the event that grid goes down, how can they um, continue to operate with what they have on site for the generation that might give them one hour, two hours, two days, three days, four days, four weeks, um, and uh, protect the mission critical assets um, and, and, and this, this maintenance of community services, right? This is, you know, hospitals are mission critical. They need to stay operational when the, these dire times hit. Uh, cost certainty is another big one. We talked earlier about they're getting uh, hospitals and healthcare um, reimbursement uh, uh, structures are changing. And so they're trying to figure out how do, we, how do we get this to be more predictable so we know what our energy costs are gonna be, right? So they're just, they're just seeking different options, advantages to hedge against future rate increases, outages, um, uh, anything that they can do to streamline that portion of their business. Um, and then this, this sustainability piece is a, you know, is a conversation that's hitting every industry, right? There's got to be, there's corporate commitments to uh, sustainability and there's, there's customer demands for, uh, for us to be better stewards of the, uh, the environment. So um, the benefits, um, you know, of, of on-site energy generation, right? And there's, there's a number of them. We'll just talk about um, <clears throat> a few of these, I think. You know, the, the second one here says a hedge against utility power pricing and high demand times. That's, that's interesting. And especially in California, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing blackouts. We're seeing um, a number of different things. And we just got to make sure that our, um, the, uh, the healthcare facilities have some way to hedge against what, um, you know, what might be a peak demand for them as well as others. Um, but they don't have the flexibility of just turning off the lights. Um, and the sale of ancillary services to the grid. Right, that's a that that gets to be a big deal. The the one that I I really like here is the monetiz, uh, monetization of uh, REC revenues if they're reusing uh, renewable resources. So um, these credits, uh, renewable renewable energy credits, uh, at this point, um, if 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 they're using renewable resources, those are actually being able to be sold back. So there's even more incentive um, to be to be smart consumers uh, of power, but stewards uh, for the environment. So a couple quick examples, um, you know, where we've really focused and worked on some uh, central plant work and uh, for for hospitals. This is the uh, Sutter Medical Center in Sacramento. Um, this is an Oshpod project, and part of uh, what we need to do was actually bring the uh, central plant up to that same Oshpod standard as the, uh, the the medical office building as well as the hospital it served. This is an 810 million dollar expansion renovation project that included two ego, uh, eight megawatt generator sets. Uh, producing over 4,000 um, tons of chillers. You know, the project, this Capitol Pavilion, sits right inside uh, the center of this campus and is just a, another example of um, Sutter trying to, to provide some of the energy for their facilities uh, to augment the, uh, the energy that they're, uh, that they're purchasing from, uh, from the utilities. Uh, this is a big project in the Milwaukee region. Um, this is in Wauwatosa at the... Uh, Milwaukee Regional Medical Center. So this is a campus of uh, facilities uh, in Milwaukee. It's uh, Children's Hospital, Freighter, Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, Blood Bank, and um, essentially 22 buildings um, that five customers um, that five customers uh, reside in. And this is uh, seven and a half thousand square feet of uh, conditioned space for this. Um, uh, for this power plant, it was this was really an upgrade, um, as well as a, so modernization, as well as uh, some some new opportunities. Eighteen thousand tons of chilled water demand uh, throughout the campus. Uh, two miles of steamed and chilled water lines, um, and this is a, a real good example again of that partnership between the um, the local utilities, uh, private and public utility companies, as well as uh, the hospital taking. Uh, control of, of some of the uh, really important facilities uh, support systems that uh, that serve their needs. Um, I really do believe we're going to see more and more of this as we as we move forward. These uh, trends and innovations we're saying that uh, companies are getting greener, um, and one of the one of the parts of those are getting smarter. So they're spending the time and money up front just to even understand how much energy they're 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 spending, how to, or they're consuming how they could get their arms around that. And then once they know, how do they augment that with, uh, with some of the things that we talked about here? So 
closing the loops on their thermal distribution um, systems. M most of the new equipment is uh, to this day is uh, primarily natural gas. We're starting to see more and more inroads on some of these other uh, power uh, source opportunities. Um, and then in all, in all cases, uh, water is a very critical component. So integrated lean project delivery, um, stat mod, modularization, panelization, um, prefabrication, and then uh, power supply and consumption. Those are three innovations uh, that we're seeing in the healthcare environment. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you.